Good morning. Good morning. It works. <laughs> Blessings to all of you today on this Lord's Day. We are glad you are here to come and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. Let us all stand to sing this opening number. One, he is worthy of our praise. One, two, Let's give him three, our praise this morning. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. It is a joy to come together for the purpose of praising and worshiping the living God. And I'm glad you're here. I trust you are glad as well. If someone dragged you along and you're not that glad, get glad and we'll enjoy worshiping together today in the house of the Lord. Welcome to you. If you're a guest with us today, in front of you, in the pew rack, is an open-the-door card. You may use that to communicate with us and let us know who you are. Or you may use the pew registry that will begin at one end of the pew and move through to the uh, other end of the pew. And if you have prayer requests or if there's a question you might have, those are good tools to use to ask of us or to mention to us that you have a prayer request or a need. So complete those, and if you complete one of the Open the Door cards, place that in the offering when that comes around a little later, and we will we'll, we'll just be glad to get to know you better and to minister to you as God gives us opportunity. A lot happening today in our world as well as in our worship let me mention just a couple of those things. We are a part of the body of Christ all around the world. Remember that. We have brothers and sisters in Christ we have not met, but that one of these days, maybe while we're still here 
or when we reach our heavenly home, we will meet brothers and sisters we didn't know we had. And I'm thankful for that, aren't you? And this is a, uh, this is a bigger family than the news media will ever tell you exists. Thank God for the Christians around the world, the people who uncompromisingly love Jesus. But we also recognize that in a world like ours, there are those because they hate Christ and they hate Christianity, they hate Christians. And so today we recognize as one of the universal realities of the church of Jesus Christ, we recognize that there are believers around our world who are facing the fiercest and most threatening persecution that one can imagine. So we're praying today and we're remembering today, and I would encourage you, mark perhaps on your bulletin or some way of just reminding yourself that someone around the world today is suffering and perhaps their life is in jeopardy just because they love Jesus. Pray for them. And even though you might not have a face or a name, ask God to help you care for your brothers and sisters in Christ by praying for them. Today is, is a, a day of prayer for the persecuted church, and we encourage you to remember those who are in need today. In just a few moments, we will have a presentation of the ministry of Gideon's International, and I want to give just a couple of notes of information that will be important to you as you give. We will receive two offerings today, and if we don't get enough, it'll be three. No, we'll, we'll be receiving two offerings today. The first one is specifically for Gideon's International. So what we'd like for you to do, so it just makes it easier for us to identify, if you would please, if you make out a check, please make out the check to Gideon's International. If you will do that, that'll just help us. Also, if you didn't come prepared to write a check for Gideon's International uh, Ministry, then I would just say this you have in the information that is provided in your bulletin, you have this insert. And inside the insert is a means of giving even by your credit card. Now you can complete that and place it in the offering, but if you don't want to do that, you can complete this and use the envelope that's also enclosed and send that in later. So however you would want to give, those means are made available to you and we encourage you to use them. Also, I want to mention that we are wanting to do our best as a pastoral team, but as a congregation to minister to you should you find yourself in a time of need. I think we've been sharing with you that through our local hospital, some of the guidelines have changed to where we cannot, at least at this point in time, access whether or not you are in the hospital. Unless you tell us in advance now we won't be able to call the hospital and just get those names. Now, that's supposed to change come spring. We're supposed to be able to call the hospital again, and they'll give us that information. But right now, they're not doing that. So if you end up in the hospital, but you don't tell us, don't think that God just tells us on Monday who's in the hospital. We trust Him, but He doesn't always tell us that. So please let us know whether or not you have a surgery coming up or you are in treatment. There's something that you want to convey about a need in your life. The best way to do that is to access our faith care ministry. Now, I dropped this, but there's a card right at my foot that um, is available for you at both welcome centers. It's just a faith care card, and it has a phone number on there. It has Pastor Ramona's name on there. It has an email address, I believe, as well. But you can access um, help for us. Thank you, Ramona. Thank you. And I want you to know who Ramona is. Ramona is working through ordination licensure, and a part of the requirement of every individual who is doing that is to be involved and be engaged in ministry. 
Ramona has exceptional organizational skills. She's far more organized than I am. And when someone like this comes along and God places them in the life of ministry, it's always a delight. She's wanting to serve. She has a servant's heart, but she also has wonderful organizational skills. So she is going to be really the resource that collects information and then dispatches that to the pastors and helps us make sure we don't miss any need. Aren't you glad for that? So we appreciate that. So this faith care card, pick up either on your way out. If you're going out that way, pick it up, pick one up or two up uh, as you leave and pass that welcome center. Or if you pass right outside the office door, cards are available there as well. But Ramona is your friend. She is our helper to help us minister to you in time of need. So I'm looking forward to how this works. Now, if you want to call the office or if you want to talk to us in the hall, just remember our memories fade between when we talk to you in the hall and when we actually have a moment to write something down. So the best way is to work through faith care so that we don't miss your need. So just welcome Ramona and let her know that you appreciate her caring and serving heart. Let's thank her for her willingness to serve in this way, shall we? Thanks, Ramona. This is also first Sunday of the month, and it is a joy to visit with one another briefly and share with the brothers and sisters in Christ that we are concerned about them and we love them. Now, you may not know someone who's sitting next to you. This is a good opportunity for you, even if you've been here 40 years and they have too, but you don't know their name. It'd be a good idea to learn, wouldn't it? It'd be a good idea to ask, but introduce yourself and welcome one another to worship. If you would, please, let's stand and let's just greet one another and welcome one another to the worship service. Is it up? Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you. You may be seated. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to make you stand right away. I'm not. Um, I do want to mention that hopefully in the next week or so or however long it takes these days to get newborns to church, I know that the doctors will say don't, you know, don't bring them to church for the first five years of their life. Um, so I know that those things are just kind of different today. I didn't know it, but, you know, I, I don't think, uh, uh, I think my mom uh, delivered me, and I was in church the first Sunday of my life. I ought to have a perfect attendance certificate somewhere that backs that up. But it's different today. I know that we're told by pediatricians different things, but one of these days, shortly, we ought to be able to see uh, Jay and Jamie Stoughton's little girl, Josephine. I'm looking forward to that day. And then also, we are just thankful for uh, the arrival of little Elliot Michael. And Elliot Michael has landed in the home of uh, Chad and Heidi Reed. And they are um, welcoming this little guy into their lives, another one that they're bringing into their home. And we look forward to seeing Elliot as well. So uh, 
come June. We'll be glad to, we'll be glad to see him, Chad. Um, somebody just remind me who they are when they show up, will you? And I'll announce them, and I'll let everybody know that they're here. But we do thank the Lord for new life and for also the precious way that God takes a life that is vulnerable and places that life in a loving Christian home. Isn't that wonderful? This congregation uniquely has been a foster care and adoption congregation. And I have never come across as many people who have loved those who were not biologically their own than this congregation. So I'm just glad that that continues to this day. We give him praise. Also, another prayer request just to be aware of. Remember our young people as they are in retreat and they are spending time together worshiping the Lord and hearing messages that are specifically from God for them. So pray for them as that concludes this morning, and then, Lord willing, as they travel back and are kept safe, they should return uh, later on. So we want you to be mindful of them as well. All of my life, growing up in the church, I have known and been aware of the ministry of Gideon's International. What a marvelous ministry getting the Word of God into the hands of people all around the world. We have promises from God's Word that His Word will not come back to us and to Him empty. And we're thankful for the power of God's Word. I don't know of anything that we could do that's more noble in our efforts to reach the lost than get the Word to them. So, with great pleasure and with just delight in how God's working, we thank you, or we thank the Gideons for wanting to minister in this way, but we also thank our own Jack Sarbaugh for being here and Faye. And Jack is in this chapter or this group of Gideons International. And before they head south to Florida, I mean, you do know what's happened in Florida, right? And weather in Florida. Just a reminder, now, before you go to Florida, uh, Jack is going to minister to us today on behalf of Gideon's International, and following his presentation, we will receive that special offering. So let's welcome Jack as he comes to share with us. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation to speak, and good morning, choir. Good morning. Thank you for making the worship experience so wonderful for me. I have some bad news for you. And I have some good news. Some time ago, a poet wrote this, and it's so appropriate today. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere, in, mere anarchy is loose upon the world. The best lack all conviction, while the verse, worst are full of passionate intensity. And things are going to get worse. You know that from reading the scripture. But the good news is this. And it's already been quoted by the pastor, and it's from Isaiah 55, 11. So shall the word that goes for out of my mouth, it shall, it shall accomplish that which I want it to, and it shall not return to me void, and it shall succeed in the things of which I sent it. That is the good news. That is God's word, which uh, the Gideons are committed to distribute as far as we can. First, let me ask uh, this question as I give you a little bit of history. Is this by chance or by design? There was a period in our history, the late 1800s, the 1900s, a group of people called the traveling salesmen. Now, you probably heard a lot of obscene jokes about it because they were obscene people. They were cigar smokers and heavy drinkers. Sunday afternoon, they get on the train and go to the first place, town, in which they were going to call on. Then Friday afternoon, 
they got on the train and went home. But there was a person called John Nicholson. He uh, came to the hotel in Boscoville, Wisconsin. And he went to the clerk and said, do you have any room? He says, no, sir, I'm sorry. Oh, but wait, wait, wait. There is one room there with two beds in it. Would you mind sharing it with somebody? He says, that's fine with me. So he asked Sam Hill, would you like someone to uh, share the room with you? Yes. As these gentlemen were getting ready to retire and turn out the kerosene lamp, uh, John Nicholson said, I always, uh, uh, always said before I return in, I have a Bible reading, I have a time of prayer. And Sim Hill says, you know, I'm a Christian too. So that night, they read John 17, and they talked about a possibility of having Bibles in hotels for the travelers. This is 1898. 1899, again, by chance <clears throat> or design, they met again in Beaver Falls, Wisconsin. From that concept, from that seed planted, we now have Gideons in 200 countries around the world countries and possessions or territories. Some of the latest ones, if you look at a map, they're just dots in the Pacific Ocean. But there are people there, people who need the word. And so there's Gideons there which will uh, <coughs> give out testaments. But also, we now have translated, which we have access to, 101 testaments in different languages. And that in itself is amazing. But for you people who are savvy with iPhones or smartphones, there's something even more, uh, it's just mind blowing what God is doing. There is on my phone, and you can get it too, there is languages, 1,233 languages on here. I have access to them. You could have access to them. And there are languages from very small groups. And the amount which are being added every day is growing. God's word is growing. And you talked about the... Uh, Christians are being persecuted. Yes, they are. But I think that I would say that we're winning. And if we weren't winning, they wouldn't bother us. But so they are being persecuted. But believe it or not, the church in India with severe persecution is growing. Home churches in China is growing. There are Christians in Iran. In fact, they've just had a, this, um, translated in their ancient Persian languages. So the word is getting out. But we need help in order to do this. So this is a penny. Every penny that you give goes to purchase scripture. The nice administrative buildings in Nashville, beautiful building, but it's paid for by the Gideons. And Gideons that go to other countries to help in their distribution, they pay their own way. Nothing is taken out from what you give. <clears throat> and I would like to think when you see this penny, you got them in your pocket, but you know, a penny, is that worth anything? Yes, it is. Just think, a penny can buy a page of scripture. A penny can buy a page of scripture. 
And it's only very recently that something significant happened. We negotiated with the publishers instead of $1.25 per uh, <coughs> New Testament, it's now $1.20. Now you think five cents, big deal. But when you think about the thousands and thousands and thousands, <coughs> you could see that we can add more scripture to the people. And something significant happened just recently. Let's go back to uh, 2014. No, uh, excuse me on that date. It is September the 30th in the year 2001. September, no, I take that time back. September the 10th in 2001. That's a significant date because we presented to President Bush the symbolic, uh, uh, to give him to that, which signified our one billion scripture distributed around the world. In 2014, we gave to President Obama a Bible signifying our two billionth scripture distributed. Do you think it took 93 years to go to our first billion and only 14 years to go to our second billion? And so we're going to keep on as Lord gives us uh, the resources to carry on that work. So these are significant things. It's wonderful things. It's exciting. When you focus on what God is doing in the world by getting his word out to as many people as he can, then maybe the end times are going to be closer than what we think. But we want to make sure that every tribe Every language is representative at the judgment seat of Christ. And one other thing is just interesting, which you pointed out. In the bulletin there, there's a little funny-looking square. And I don't ask me what it meant, but you have on here what is called a QR reader. I haven't used it, but it works, I understand. You take that and take a picture of that little square in your bulletin, and it gets you all the information you need, and you can even send your, uh, your gift to the Gideon through that method. For those who savvy, you might want to try it and tell me how it works. <laughs> so in conclusion, I would say this. Pray for us as we uh, give out the distribution Pray for the people who receive a testament that the Holy Spirit will work within them to lead them into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And third, that the funds will keep on coming and that the translators will keep on. But the Wycliffe translators think that uh, by the year 2025, they will have about 99.9% .9 of all the languages covered in the world. And that is exciting news. So the bad news, think of on the good news. Thank you again for your invitation. We have excellent Gideon representation in our own congregation, Jack being one of those. But I'd like for those who serve with the Gideons or have served with the Gideons, would you just stand so that we can recognize in our congregation those who serve in that role? We have Rick, I think Joe, and, and wives as well. Would you please stand? Good. So if you, this is wonderful, wonderful, yeah. How remarkable, Jack, the things that you just shared with us, and aren't we thankful for the work of Wycliffe translators that are going into the remotest parts of, of, the, of our world to find out how in the world they can understand the language and translate it so that a, a Bible can be 
printed in that language. Isn't that remarkable? Now, what a good work to give toward, isn't it? And the Word of God going out to our world. So as our ushers come, we are going to pray and just, I would just urge you, be generous with this wonderful work. You are a generous people, and I don't know of a better cause that we could bring to your attention than the work of the Gideons. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you that throughout the centuries you have preserved your word. Thank you that even when believers were not given opportunity to have your word, those changes came about which we have just celebrated. We thank you for people like Wycliffe and now the Wycliffe Bible translators. We thank you for the work of the Gideons who understand the importance of getting your powerful, penetrating word into the minds and hearts of people all around the world. Thank you that your promise is still true, that it never comes back empty. So help us to give to this great work and be partners with this wonderful, wonderful effort to spread your good news of Jesus all around the world. Bless this offering and bless our Gideons and their work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike. I am going to alter things just a little bit. I'm going to impose on Dr. Hermes. I'm going to impose on him. If you would make your way up here, I'd like for you to pray the invocation. Dr. Thomas Hermes. <clears throat> I forget about the, the dueling siblings. So... But as Dr. Hermes is coming uh, to pray our invocation, and I would like for us to stand and remain standing for worshiping in song following his prayer of invocation, I would just like to say this about Dr. Hermes. He is uh, serving in his last year of three terms, and we have so appreciated his ministry to our denomination as a pastor as a congregation in this denomination, we have been fortunate to have his leadership. We remain fortunate as he ministers to us and tries to guide and lead us 
in this last year of his term. But I so appreciate him and thank God for him. Often I kind of make fun of him when I occasionally see him because he's the member who's never here. But he's a busy man. He's out preaching and he's out doing the work of God. But he's a great gift from God to us. And we appreciate the gifts God gives us. So I just wanted him to come, if he would please, and lead us in our prayer of invocation today as we continue in our worship. And let's be attentive to the Holy Spirit as we share this time of prayer together. Let us pray. Father, we can truly say from the depths of our heart, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. It is here that we are fed, nourished, challenged, corrected, reproved. It is here that we hear the word of God, words that are eternal, words that are life-changing, words that will make a difference in all of our lives a thousand years from now, wherever we might be in eternity. And so this is a wonderful place to be. We love the fellowship of the saints, the inspiration that comes from the music and the preaching of the word, the opportunity to just lift our hearts and voices together in prayer. And we also want to give you thanks for the work of the Gideons. What a joy it's been to see their Bibles literally all over the world and to know that this is a great organization that is changing and impacting lives in a wonderful way. Continue to bless them. We're thankful, Lord, for those that are watching today on live stream. Some of them, it's just not possible for them to be here. And we pray that you will minister to them in a very real and special way. And may their spiritual needs be met. We know there are those out there that would love to be here, but are limited because of their physical condition. And we just pray that you will be near to them and send those that can encourage them along the way. And so, Father, we would ask your blessing on this service, all that is said and done here today as the word of God is preached, as we partake of the sacrament. May it once again be a very sacred, hallowed, holy moment in our lives. But Father, we all need to draw closer to you. There's so much in this life and this world that distracts us and would drag us down and would uh, confuse us and be very negative in our lives. So I just pray this will be a time when we'll come to the cross and look into the eyes of our Savior and see your incredible, amazing, unconditional love that you laid down your life for us, that we might live, that we might have eternal life. And yes, there is bad news and it is a dark world, but we're thankful for the light of the gospel that shines brighter and farther than ever before. And I pray that in this day and in this community of Lancaster, Ohio, that so desperately needs you, I would ask your blessing to be on Faith Memorial Church and on all those churches that preach the gospel, that this community might be impacted in powerful and positive ways for the glory of God. And Father, we'll give you all the praise and all the honor, for we ask these things in your precious and holy name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Dr. Hermes. Let us continue on our worship. This is amazing grace. Let's sing it out. The power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory. The King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. 
That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me brings our chaos back into order, who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of his brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing. Grace, this is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You laid down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for. All that you've done for me This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free I sing for all that you've done for me. Amen. It is that amazing grace that amazing gift that he has given to us. We are also thankful for the power that he has given to us. That same power that rose Christ from the grave is in us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's sing the same power this morning. I can see the waters raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear the sound of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. We can walk. Down this dark and painful road I can face Every fear of the unknown I can hear All God's children singing out We will not be overtaken We will not be overcome The same power Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to wake, lives in us, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks, the same power that can calm a raging sea, lives in us. Lives in us, he lives in us, lives in us. We have hope that his promises are true in his strength. There is nothing we can do, yes, we know. There are greater things in store. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. The 
same power that rose Jesus from the grave. The same power that commands the dead to wake lives in us, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks, the same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us, lives in us, he lives in us, lives in us. Greater is he that is living in me, he's Lives in us, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks. The same power that can calm a raging sea. Lives in us, lives in us. He lives in us, lives in us. Amen. Amen. We are thankful for that power. You may be seated. You may be seated as we ask the ushers to come forward at this time as we receive the tithes and offerings that we have been instructed to give to our Lord. Isn't that a joy to give to the Lord? This is our, our opportunity. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful for the amazing grace, that same power that you give to us. We are thankful for these things this morning. We are thankful for the faculty of memory. We are thankful for this gift and how we remember and reflect on your son's sacrifice. But more importantly, not only the forgiveness of sin, but also eternal life that awaits each and every one who calls upon his name and believes in him. Lord, we pray that you bless us as we partake in the holy sacraments later on in the holy communion. Father, we pray that as we remember and reflect that we are never the same again, that you have enriched our lives. We are thankful to you for who you are and what you mean to the entire world. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, choir, and thank you, Pastor Mike. We are looking today at 1 John chapter 3. So if you're going to turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, and I hope you do, I know that everything's just about digital today, but I just like to hear old-fashioned pages rustling. And I actually like to hold a book in my hands these days. I, it's interesting where we are. Hold on to your actual Bibles because if we ever have some kind of a blackout or you can't access through your smartphone or your iPad or your Kindle, your computer, your TV, whatever, if you can't access the Word of God, you'll want to have an old-fashioned copy of it, and I encourage you to keep that. We are also glad, I just want to mention this, we're just glad to have back with us Ed and Stella Senig. And, uh, you know, it's about time they came back, so we're glad that they're here, and we welcome them back to worship with us. Didn't want to neglect that. Before we read from this text, I want to say that language gives us difficulties, even though it's a, it's a gift, and language is the way that we communicate ideas, yet language also has its deficiencies and its issues. We have become a culture that overuses, overuses, overuses modifiers. We have also become a culture that overuses superlatives. What's a superlative? Awesome. So if you had a good breakfast, it was awesome. Or if you got that dress on sale, it was awesome. 
we just overuse and overuse to where sadly the things that truly are awesome, what really is amazing, is brought low and in many respects demeaned. That's a sad thing about language, is that if everything is awesome, nothing is awesome. If everything is just the best, the most, all of that, the greatest, then nothing is the best, the most, the greatest. I think in many respects we ought to tone down our language so that there's a greater appreciation for what's truly amazing and what is truly awesome. So I want to speak to you today about God's amazing love. And it's taken from this text. If you would please just stand for these first three verses and then you may sit down and never stand again. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies Himself just as He is pure. You may be seated. I want to share with you very, very briefly four main points from this text. I hate to be brief about God's amazing love, but looking at where we are in the flow of things, even though you slept an extra hour, I know the limitations of time. I want to share just four realities that come from this great text. One, God's love aims. God's love aims. We often hear songs or sing songs or we're, in gar we're, we're involved in different kinds of settings where there's a very sentimental view of God's love and somehow we're just kind of warmed by it. There's a deep tone of sentimentality to it and we speak in tones that are really more like a family reunion, which is not all bad, but really diminishes the real depth and scope of God's love. God loves, and the very word that is a verb revealed to us in Scripture that God loves us indicates that His love has aims for us. He aims at something when He generates His love toward us. When He expresses love toward us, it is not just sentiment. There is a purpose. There is a deep intentionality behind the fact that God loves you and me. His aim is specific. His purpose is very um, intent and intense. He has on his great heart one objective, and that is to not leave us alone in our predicament morally, spiritually, and in our plight. Thanks be unto God, he aims when he loves us. And one of those reality is, realities is he does not want to leave us unchanged. I would pray that as we read Scripture and as, as we understand devotion and as we are true followers of Jesus, we would understand that God's saving us is far more than lifeboat perspective. It is far more than God just, again, throwing us a lifeline so that we don't die. Redemption is, thankfully, far more than that. It is not just that we get out of here by the skin of our teeth. The purpose that God has when He loves us is to restore us in the image and likeness of His Son, Jesus Christ. Christ. That is far more, that is far more comprehensive in its saving work than we could ever imagine. God has aims on us 
as he loves us. And it is that he will destroy the works of the devil. If we were to read farther in 1 John 3, we would understand that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to undo what the fall did to us all through the meritorious suffering on the cross of Jesus the Christ. He has aims for you and me. I just want to pronounce to you with great joy in my heart today, He has aims for you and for me. Second thing, and I know you marvel that we got there so fast, but the second thing is God's love adopts. We have recent testimonies, fresh testimonies, of the beautiful gift in this life of adoption. There's a little boy, as we mentioned, now in Chad and Heidi Reed's home, along with big sister Morgan, because of the marvelous gift of adoption. Herein is love. If you want to, if you want to stare at and and contemplate the magnitude of God's love, which is what we're encouraged to do in this text. Look at it. Behold it. See it. See what manner of love, what kind or quality and even quantity of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. That word called also can be translated beautifully using the word named. You and I are so loved by God that the aim of His heart is to adopt us back into the family through the means that Jesus has made available to us that by the transforming new birth reality of God's saving grace, we might be adopted as His named children. What a gift. God's love adopts. He wants to bring us in. Now, how, how real is this? Well, evidently, John, feeling as if this needed some emphasis, said this, and such we are. <laughs> Isn't that good? He has called us to be children of God, and this is what we are. Thanks be unto God. He has indeed the authority to usher into existence a family that prior to His gracious reach of us, we were not a family. He adopts. God's love aims. God's love adopts. Third thing I want us to note is God's love assures. Friends, there's, there's a reality that I don't want us to miss today. It's a biblical reality, but I would also say, thankfully, it is a Wesleyan reality. This reality is, in essence, the continental divide between us and a lot of other theological positions, and it is simply known as, but profoundly in effect, known as the doctrine of assurance. I don't know that you know this, and I'm not going to belabor this point, but I am going to mention this. If you think that this is a matter taken for granted, let me just say to you there are whole schools of theology that have asserted for years, for hundreds of years, that we cannot know whether or not we are a child of God. Now let me just tell you something. Thanks be unto God that His Word reveals something quite to the contrary, and that is that His Spirit witnesses to our spirit that we are a child of God. We can know we are children of God. Praise His name. Why in the world would a holy, loving God want to keep us chronically wondering, doubting, perplexed about whether or not we were indeed a child of God. Those are pessimistic, failing theologies. Thank God for a theology that straight from the heart of God that says you can know 
the doctrine of assurance. God's love assures. What decent parent would use his leverage on their children? The constant pressure of, well, I'm not sure you're my child or not. What kind of, we, we turn you over to child protective services if you treated your children that way. So John makes it clear, not only are we adopted and we are his children, this is who we are, but then he goes on to say, especially regarding the question we all have at one time or another, maybe multiple times in our lives, what will we be? Come on, you've wondered that. What will we be? You see, our senses and our ability to grasp reality is very much earthbound, isn't it? We know each other by face. We know each other by appearance. We know the realities that we live by today. And the question is, what will be? How will we be known? And what will life be like beyond this brief life? What will it be? Well, John has something to say about that. He was inspired to say it. He says, not only are we children, and this is who we are, and he goes on to say, for this reason the world does not know us because it didn't know him. Don't think that the world will appreciate you when they don't appreciate Jesus, just as a side note. So just get ready for that. But beloved, he says, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. But we know. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. I don't know what Dave will look like, what I'll look like. I hope it's better. Um, for you, Dave, and for me. <laughs> We're all in agreement on this. <laughs> That was terrible. I should, I, I should repent right now. <laughs> I don't think there's a one of us that would say, I just want a do-over of this. Oh, man, I want something better than this. I'm hoping for something better than this. We don't know what we will be, but we know this. If you go back a few verses from where we read, and if you move on, there is this constant emphasis of abiding, abiding abiding. And if we remain in Him, we have promises from Him. These promises are that not only has He built and prepared a place for us, but far greater even than the place. What really makes the place the place is who is there. The place is defined by His presence. And what he said in John 14 as a point of comfort to his disciples, he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to go away, but here's what you can count on. I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. Isn't that good? So our greatest joy, our greatest sense of identity will not be whether we have dark hair or blonde hair or hair at all, but it is anchored in whose we are in Christ and who we are in Christ. Because the greatest reward is being, abiding, remaining, being in Christ. There's our greatest joy. The last point. You do understand how abbreviated these have been. So much I'd like to say. But the last point is this. God's love activates. The third verse gives us a picture of a truth that perhaps we don't explore enough. And it is this. God works in us supernaturally. We know that, don't we? He works supernaturally in us so that as His grace is being, as light is being walked in, and as we are moving through God's renovation of us, 
God's salvation plan for us as we are lockstep with His Spirit and moving in step with Him, He gives us the wherewithal by the help of the Holy Spirit and the aiding of our own will to be in many respects self-cleaning. Now you may have a self-cleaning oven and you might say, it's never worked. Well, I'm, don't compare it to that. The fact is, God gives you and me the wherewithal to choose as we should so that we remain in the love of Christ, so that we remain keeping close tabs with Him on our own lives so that we maintain a moral course and trajectory that has the best chance of keeping us in the love of Christ, we then can shape to varying degrees the content and character of our day. You and I can have a reinforced will to take ourselves to the places we ought to go and avoid the places we ought to avoid. God gives us the power to choose against what is damaging to us and choose that which is enabling and holy for us. God gives us that great joy because as we fix our hope on the Holy One, we don't want to be unholy. Therefore, as our hope is fixed on Jesus the Christ, as our hope is joined with His character and who He is and His likeness, the result is you and I want to be like Him. So He who has this hope fixed on Him purifies His heart, purifies His mind, even as He is pure. Let me just give you a four instance before I close. That means if you have a choice between meaningless endeavors, wasteful, prodigal endeavors, you will choose that which nurtures your spiritual life, your God, Godward trajectory, the way that you ought to go. You'll read the Word, you'll pray, you'll seek His face, you'll sing His song. You'll gather with His people. Yes and amen. You'll gather with His people. You will worship. You will express yourself in adoration and love for Him. You will do that because your hope is fixed on Him. I do not believe that God ever intends salvation to mean that He will drag you kicking and screaming to heaven. Uh -uh. I believe he will wonderfully activate your will to will his will and to walk with him in ways that lead to and lend to holiness. Amen. Amen. So I just want to say to you, isn't God's love Amazing. No wonder Charles Wesley wrote, Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? If you don't know Jesus this way, you can thank God you can. If you don't know His aims on you, if you're just getting introduced to all of this, know that He has wonderful, loving aims. If you're not adopted yet, you can be. And if you don't have assurance that you're a child of God, you can. And when all that happens, you will be activated to live a new life in Christ Jesus. Amen. To His glory to His praise, to His honor, and for our good. Amen. 
Father, in these closing moments, we pray that as we prepare to receive these elements, we pray that you will continue through your Spirit to minister to our hearts. Before we just move on through a part of our worship, if anyone needs to come and call on the name of the Lord, we pray that this would be the place that they could certainly do that. Whether they come to an altar of prayer or whether they do it where they are, I pray, Father, that someone today will have been compelled to embrace the love of God, embrace the love of Christ that is directed specifically toward them. So help us as we close in these moments, as we sing and as we just are quiet in our spirit and attentive in our heart and mind. Holy Spirit, do your work. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We'll sing. I urge you, if you don't know this Jesus, he's reaching to you today. He's pursuing you today. Let's listen to him.
may be seated. On these occasions when we share the Lord's Supper together, these are sacred moments that I am always grateful to be able to share with you. I trust that we never ever allow these moments to become just a ritual. We know the meaning is marvelously contained, the meaning of the cross is marvelously contained in this simple yet profound expression. The work of the cross, atonement, is contained in these two expressions of these elements. Isn't that wonderful? So as we worship in this way, never treat these steps and these acts in a trivial way. May we approach these moments with an appreciation for the sacred act of Christ and his sacrifice. Father, as we receive these elements today, we pray that you would take them from any common use, sanctify them to our bodies, and then our bodies and our lives to you and your service. Take these elements and remind us of the gift, the sacrifice of Christ for each of us. We perhaps could never find a greater expression of your love. So as we receive these elements, may we do so by faith, with thanksgiving, worshiping you and honoring you as we have been instructed to do. In Jesus' name, amen. If those who assist would please come, we will prepare to receive you and share these elements with you. If you need to be served where you are, please get the attention of those who will be serving among the congregation, and we'll be glad to help you. If you can make it to one of the stations, we welcome you to join us there. Aren't you glad that the only membership that counts is being a member of the body of Christ? You don't have to be a member of this church to come and participate in this way because we recognize the most important membership is that which Christ alone has the authority to give, and that is to call us His children. So if you are walking with Him faithfully, serving Him joyfully, and you have thanksgiving in your hearts, we invite you, welcome you to come and receive these elements. You may come.
for worshiping. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for worshiping together. It is always a joy to be in the house of the Lord. I thank God for the opportunity to worship with you this day. I appreciate the prayer of Dr. Hermes, and I trust that it is the sentiment of our hearts when we leave here today. It has been good to have been in the house of the Lord. Let's stand together. We'll pray, and then we will be dismissed. We thank you, our Father, for this day and these moments. Now send us from here in the power of your Spirit to go and serve in our world with the great hope of Jesus Christ. May we be motivated always by the love of Christ shed abroad in our hearts. And may the light shine brightly in the darkness so that others will be brought to that beacon of true hope, which is Christ the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Go in His grace and peace. You're dismissed.